Call to order the Equity and Social Justice Standing Committee meeting. It's called to order on July 23 to 2021 at 2.03 p.m. Many members who will identify themselves by first and last name to form on the established forum. Bill Mellinger, Trustee Area 1. Madam Lindemann, Trustee Area 4. Jordan Garvey, Trustee Area 3. Our five. <laughs> <laughs> City Barnard, Trustee Area 3. Dan Ridley, Area 2. In the Pledge of Allegiance, I'm going to ask our esteemed superintendent to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, please rise. All right, hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. And now the adoption of agenda. Propose 2.1 proposed revisions and deletions. None. 2.2 proposed addition of agenda items pursuant to GC 54954.2B12. None. 2.3 proposed adjustments in the order of business. None. 2.4 adoption of the agenda. So moved. Second. It's moved by Natalie, second by Cindy. All those in favor? Aye. 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 3.0. 3.0 public testimony. I believe we have one public testimony. Um, public comment period for items listed on this agenda and non agenda items within the subject. The public comment period is administered by state law and is the point in the meeting set aside for members of the public to share their opinions with the committee. Open meeting laws do not permit the committee to engage in dialogue or answer questions. Though it may not take action on non-agenda issues raised in the public comment period, the committee, for example, may refer any matters to the superintendent for review or take action to direct staff to, take, to place a matter of business on the future agenda. Due to the modified meeting procedures during the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic, if a member of the public would like to address the committee on agenda and non-agenda items within the subject matter of their jurisdiction, an email should be submitted, should have been submitted to Jordana Ridden by noon today. Written comments will be read aloud and are limited to five minutes per item. The board limits the total input time for items within the same subject to 20 minutes. Public comment to 3.2 public comments. And we've got one, Jordan, if you read that, please. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, stated July 21st, 2021, for the Social Justice and Equity Committee meeting, July 23rd, 2021. Hello, and good afternoon to the Equity and Social Justice Committee and District Staff and Superintendent. At March 10th, 2021, Equity and Social Justice Committee meeting, you defined equity and social justice. It was good to see that your equity definition includes every child, and your social justice definition includes all students, and that you are, and that you are focusing on academics. You also agree to the committee's purpose, which includes in part equity, social justice, systemic racism, and gender biasness, as well as seeking out experts in those areas. It is clearly evident that you care about the students in our district and that you desire to do things better to improve our school district. Thoughtful discussions took place. Looking at today's agenda, it appears that the focus is equity. I continue to ask many of the same questions that I asked at your March 10th meeting. Your social justice definition includes equitable and quality education. Those quoted, yeah, quote, equitable and quality education, end quote. Your personal answers to the questions will determine how you will seek to help the students in our school district. If you get the problem wrong, the solution will be wrong. Do you believe systemic racism is embedded into society and that white people are oppressors and that people of color are oppressed? That it is everywhere? Or do you believe that racism, prejudice, partiality can exist in life situations and those situations need to be changed? Those are two completely different questions. Which world do you, you, the world, do you hold? We all have one. 
are all disparities in student outcomes the result of oppression? Is oppression the only reason for disparities? Do you believe inherent human dignity, value, and worth is found in each and every one of us? Or do you believe that race, gender, sex, and other identities are what defines who we are? Inherent human dignity, value, and worth in systemic racism are contradictory terms. When focused on race, gender, sex, and other identities, you are dividing people into groups and not uniting. Common human dignity brings unity. Is truth objective or is subjective based on lived experiences? Are there common core values such as dignity, respect, responsibility, hard work? How do fairness to all and equal outcomes, equity, go together? What are the historical origins of social justice and equity? What are your definitions of words such as inclusion, diversity, equity, systemic racism, gender biasness? And what are examples of how they play out in life? Practical examples of what they look like when implemented. These words and what they look like in practice have different meanings for different people. I appreciate your care and concern for the students in the work of the World Unified School District. I look forward to your thoughtful discussions as you define these words and they look like them into practice. Thank you for your time, Gail Russell. Thank you, Dan. Um, by the way, I think we did order. Um, Michelle, I, I think we may have missed putting in here the um, approval of our minutes from our last meeting. No, it's at the end. I didn't see it. Yes, it is 5.0. 5 5.0 .0 and 5.1. It's at the top of the page. Thank you for the order. You're welcome. Reports and presentations. 4.1 CSBA Equity Committee Report. And for this, I'm going to move to the podium. So, thank you, everybody. Yes. What we can attempt to do in the next 60 minutes is to give you four weeks of presentations was actually was, I believe, two days of presentations each time. So we're gonna try to compile that all down, compact that all down into a 60 minute presentation. Uh, Cindy's promised to keep me on, on track here to keep this all done, right? You're supposed to time. Oh, I'm coming to you, okay. Uh, so as we run through the slides, we're gonna try to go, we're not gonna go through every detail in every slide, but we're, we wanna give you a feel for what we got. And, and I should say that, we're giving you the presentation as we received it. We're not trying to filter it for you. We're simply trying to present to you what, what we received as we went through the training that was put on by the CSBA. And so um, we're going to start. And I'm trying to get my own back here to so begin. There we go. Governance with an equity lens is the name, is the title of our, our product, the report. Excuse me. Okay, slow down. It's the title of the training that we went through, a systemic approach to closing equity gaps in public education put on by CSBA. There were actually, as I said, four different sessions. Two of those sessions were just with Southern uh, LEAs, and then two were with the entire state of, of LEAs that were participating. Next, and then this way, right? The session purposes that, and the goal of this whole experience was to understand effective governance practices. And we talked a lot about governance. We're not going to actually cover any of that today in our slides because the, we have a good understanding, hopefully, of governance, the difference between what administration does, what the faculty does, and then what we as a board, we set policy, we guide things, we don't step into how things are done. That's what our experts and our educators do. Second thing is to understand the role of the board and the superintendent staffs and what I just referred to. Then to define equity with a policy lens. To say, okay, what is the policy? And CSBA actually has a policy that uh, recommended one that we're going to be presenting to you later in the meeting. 
and let you look at that and see if that's something that we want to actually select as our policy statement. Then to recognize and respond to the barriers to equity. And that's as we try to look at our district, are there things that are hindering people in our district, that's any student in our district from an equitable education experience? And finally, to develop, evolve an equity statement. We have not written an equity statement. We have equity statements that we're going to be sharing with you and ideas on, uh, but we have not tried to actually develop one yet. We obviously, the three of us, had some discussion in that regard. Michelle and Cindy and I attended, but we're right now we're not presenting. Here's our statement. By the way, um, Michelle or Cindy, if at some point you think I really own something, you're welcome just to say so. Okay. As we went through this, there were agreements we made, and that was that we would stay in that we would experience discomfort, that we would speak the truth, and that we would expect and accept non-closure. So I'm going to ask that you guys just be willing to make that same kind of commitment as we go through even the process today. And equity in education, what does it mean? First of all, equity is not about equality, everyone getting the same thing. Equity means giving people what they need when they need it. And you'll notice that Cindy mentioned that this morning in our board workshop. And then again, it's a very, very appropriate phrase that people need to have assistance, resources, training, education when they need it. Some need more assistance than others. Student success is demonstrated in diverse ways. There's a lot of different ways for us to measure success and to actually assess how a student is doing. Um, and then the last one on, on equity areas is that intentional shifts in mindset, policy, and practice have prioritized the interruption of systemic inequities. If there are systemic inequities, we want to deal with them. If there's things that we are doing that are hindering people from getting a good education, we want to approach and deal with them. Now, Michelle's going to, excuse me, Cindy's going to talk about what are the challenges to equity. So in this training through the four different sessions, we talked about some of those barriers and some of those challenges for our different student groups as they try to get to that equitable education opportunities for all. There are historical inequities, and we did go through a history of education timeline on how it, how it developed, how it first uh, the concept of educating our kids occurred. That history, historical timeline is in your folders. If you go into board docs, you go to equity and education committee, and then you see the folder that said, uh, says reading materials, it's dropped there. Um, then you have resistance to change. And we talked about that a little bit with Jay. You get used to doing the same thing without realizing that you, you want to make things better, or you want change, but you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, getting the same outcomes and the same story. So, and you do have those people that are like, well, wait a second, this isn't my fault. This isn't, I wasn't, I, I wasn't alive in the 1600s or the 1700s. This isn't my fault that education developed this way. We, we all have the ability to, to as we govern through an equity lens, and looking at data, what does that story tell us? Looking at our climate and culture and look, hearing what our students are saying, hearing what our teachers are saying, and being able to have those listening sessions and saying, okay, this is how we can go forward with changing our story. Privilege and entitlement of those who have the potential to oppress. And this was interesting because it is a trigger word, oppression. But the thing is, is that as we look at it through education, there are barriers, like Bill said, for all student groups, but specifically the ones um, that race, disability, gender, gender identity, that have those extra layers to overcome. And so how, how does what we do 
end up keeping them in the same spot with the same challenges and never getting beyond those challenges. And it's always difficult for them. So, and some of that we talked about today with Jay and, and in our discussion, making sure that we're looking at every single child and making sure that they get what they need when they need it. And that may be different from for one child over another because of their different challenges. Maybe it's their socioeconomic status that really is holding them back. And, and how do we how do we change that? Implicit bias, we there are sometimes unfortunately in education and whether it's in the curriculum, whether it's in the way that we look at data, whether it's in trainings, whether it's in we, we try to recognize how we see people, how we view educating as a child in certain ways. Everybody is different and you need to make sure that the biases aren't creating additional barriers for those children. Stereotypes, we can get into stereotypes of, of disability, having an implicit bias that we have created a certain stereotype for our, our, our children of disability, our special needs children, and racism. Racism that of skin type, ethnicity, cultural differences. And we, we talked a lot about in, throughout this training, recognizing that that is a layer that is a barrier, that is a challenge, and that it, in order to overcome that, you really need to be able to, to, to be courageous to look at that, at look at what, what Bill already said, is look at your policies, your practices, and really saying, okay, we need to interrupt what is creating those barriers for these children and making and making it better for them so that they reach the same potential as any other child. Thanks, Evita. Now Michelle's going to talk about what are some of the actions that create equity. So this is we've we've recognized the things in the columns prior and now what actions and steps can we take? And I think that a lot of these things tie into work that has begun already in RIN. So changing policy and practice to provide access and opportunity. I'm just going to read you the list and then say a couple of things. Shifting resources to those who need more, building positive relationships amongst all stakeholders, empowering marginalized stakeholders, and shifting mental models. So I want to think about the work that we talked about today with Jay, just the work with action plans, hit some of these things. What we're doing to adopt a policy using CSB's language but making it RIM, that, that's hitting on those things. Um, our new community liaison position, um, her and Heather have been working on um, revamping the parent university that Derek runs and working with Cal State Fresno. We're working in, in doing those things. Um, how we write our LCAP. Um, talks about how we shift resources to those that need it more. All the work you just signed up to do to be on committees and to, to hear people and to be out in our community. Um, so really, and, and again, I think a lot of this ties back to the LCAP and action plans and more policy and what we're doing. So we, we are on a good trajectory of what we're doing with today. Thanks, Michelle. Really good. By the way, in case things any sort of mentioned it, there is a folder inside the board. This actual PowerPoint presentation is there. We have a number of other things that we're going to be sharing with you that are in the folder as well. Uh, but if you want to follow the presentation, it is in there as well. Uh, there is a definition uh, that was given. Uh, you are not me, but I forget you. <laughs> Uh, there's a definition that was presented uh, regarding educational equity. It means that each child will receive what they need to develop to their full academic or social potential. I'm not going to read through the rest of that detail, but the thing is, is that this whole series of studying what we were doing and saying, what are we going to do to help every single student to excel? I think we want every student to graduate, graduate well, and to do well once they leave. There's a portrait of graduate that's something like that. And so 
this is equity is not it's helping everyone, every student. Um, but I wanted to jump forward to our equities definition that we actually formed, if you remember, it's in our minutes. Equity in education is the process of reforming practices, policies, and procedures at the school and the district levels to support academic fairness and inclusion, and to ensure that every child has the resources, teachers, interventions, and supports they need to be successful in life. Look at that. Equity in education is about every student being successful and us doing what we need to do. So we have to set the overarching policies. We've got to provide the resources so that our staff can do the things that really help every student to be successful. Throughout our um, training, we were given cap moments. These were moments where we were to confirm what was being said, ask questions about it, or even being provoked maybe by what was being said. Um, I'm just going to share that the one piece of it that kind of bothered me was that most of the training, if I can put it appropriate, we just shut, shut the microphone off, okay? Most of the training focused on equity for African American for Black students. And while I believe that is important, we have to look at all students. And that especially, that is particularly here, we have a whole wealth of different students, different poverty levels and all that, different social economic levels and all that we've got to look at. So that's why you'll notice we, we're seeing equity for all students. But unfortunately, a lot of the focus was on, was on the Black community. However, I'm going to put this caveat on our largest demographic in our district, in our school size, are the um, Hispanic slash Latinos. I'm using deliberately those words because not in the dashboard and data class on CDE. And the practices of dealing with uh, that were discussed in the strategies strategy during this training that, that inferred um, Black children, Black students. Actually, it's very translatable to any student population, including our Latino Hispanic population. Um, they have some of the same challenges that Black students do, um, in the, but they also have a myriad of other layers and nuances in their home life, um, language, and 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 um, yeah, and cultural relevance that is different than Black. But there were definitely information and strategies that are translatable to other students of color. In our in our folder, we've been putting some of the videos and um, Dr. Dr. Navarro's um, video is in that folder for you to look at and I would urge you to consider looking at this, viewing this video. It's got some profound and provocative thoughts um, and this more we'll be talking about later too. One of the things that we're really seeing is that, and we've said this in more than one conversation, and that is, is that equity in, in education has to be data driven. It can't just be our feelings. So we've got to be looking at achievement and academic test scores. We're looking at disproportionality. Where are certain students missing this? What we do in LCAP, like Michelle said, another way you do, what we're doing here is really already starting to address issues of equity and looking at how is every student having their needs met. And we have to do all kinds of assessments from, from the AP honors to gate courses to quality experience teachers. And what kind of opportunities are we giving to our English learners, for example, of which we have a significant number. In fact, one of the things you're going to hear is even talking about is stakeholders and how we communicate with stakeholders. And, and we're going to have to look at different ways of communicating. We may actually have to set up some Spanish speaking um, conversations where we get translated to. Um, so that's going to have to be a part of this process as we try to uh, understand uh, and look at both data, which is both hard data, but then there's soft data, isn't it? The soft data is what we learn from people. 
We're going to need to ask ourselves, why does equity, why do equity gaps exist in education? And, and this is a very interesting cartoon by Albert Einstein in our education system. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. And then you can kind of imagine which one of those are you. Are you the elephant, the penguin, the monkey, the bird, the fish in the tank, uh, the seal, or the dog? And which one would climb that tree better? And each one has different skills and abilities. And did I just put two two times soon? Yeah, we're right on what so we're as we went through this, one of the things we looked at was the California School Dashboard, and that is going to be an important tool as we looked at issues of equity. We also looked at, and you know, I believe I've put this in there, the history of public education and how public education, what it was designed to do, who it was even designed for. It was actually designed to keep some students from being taught. And so we have to look at, as we were talking this morning, what maybe are the creative things that we have to do today to make sure that we're not hindering people from getting a good education. Again, that is the end of the folder. And here are several items about data and long-term impact in, on communities of miseducated youth. We're looking at where, where are people missing things. And so we're going to evaluate things. Is there a glass ceiling? Unemployment, is there over policing or high incarceration? I think we have some very positive relationship with uh, law enforcement here on the mountain. Uh, and, and, and you have to realize as we're looking at this, we're looking at this from the whole state, right? And let's face it, there are certain communities that are very, very extremely different, even in law enforcement relationships and, and even what the schools provide compared to our community. But what we're looking at our school district and what we do. We're looking at is there high crime and exploitation? Is there gen central gen okay, slow down. gentrification, <laughs> housing issue disparities, and homelessness, which we know we have a number of those in our, in our community? Are there wealth disparities? And we know there's some difference in the wealth because, because of our school district, uh, maybe not as dramatic as what we heard about this morning, but we've got some. some just look at the housing crisis in the Lake area compared to Crestline, enough said. Social capital network disparities, poor mental and physical health that, that some people have, uh, high mortality rates or low birth rates, lack of family stability. Is there high divorce, which is frankly one of my concerns, a significant amount of that. The number of families up here that are blended families or that now grandma and grandma are raising children. There's a lot of that in within our community. So there's a lack of family stability. There's negative self-identity and hopelessness and somehow and racial disparities across and within all institutions. Now, these are just some of the things that we have to look at the evidence that's out there. Say, what's, what's going on in, in our community? What we're now going to do though is we're going to discuss the data, some of the data that we have for Room of the World Unified School District. And so now I'm going to ask Cindy, who's been doing hours and hours of work on data. She and Tori have done some things together as well. Now, some of this comes from things together that you've done, but um, we're, we're going to now have Cindy kind of give a report on what does our data tell us. So throughout the year, we, all, we obviously have presentations on the dashboard and we break it down with our undeclared account. That's a big, huge focus because that clip is what LCFF provides our funding. We give services to our undeclared account students. We're measured on that. Other needs to do multiple reports on that. Jim gets to do multiple reports on that. So here are the in, in sometimes you hear does is Rim. Is Rim just starting this equity process? And I have to say, no, we've been doing equity work. Um, with, in fact, OCAP has been driving equity with the focus of our traditionally underserved students, the English language learners, our low income, the um, foster homeless youth migrant, that, those sectors. And the school sites have been looking at their data through that lens. And what this was an attempt of at doing is showing the story that we have been looking at data through an equity lens. It, it has been a focus on, on the unduplicated 
funds because of how we have our funding. So in terms of ethnicities, specific focus on ethnicities, we just need to expand our focuses to incorporate more of that. We know our Hispanic ethnic, is a, a, this ethnic group is our major um, ethnic minority. I don't even like to use that minority because they're a majority of us. And, and um, so having those conversations beyond just our duplicate account. So if you go into your equity and justice community folder in data, that's where we're, we're giving you examples of where the conversations are going. Um, a lot of it is high school because the, the rim high school, especially because it drives a lot of the, the factors on the dashboard that the elementary schools do not. So I'm going to take you through some of the ones that um, that the high school has been working on since basically 2015-16 school year, having these conversations with their side council. Um, obviously, we have the graduation rate that comes to us. Tori brings us, and Dave Nyberg brings us reports from the two high schools. Um, we do get the SIPSAs from every school with, the, with their their impact dashboard and their other indicators. So there is equity embedded in our school plans for student achievement as well. So one that um, um, Tori really, Tori and I met and, and completely beat that man. So if you want to take a look at the RIM High School AP Honors five years, if you want to click on that data. So the really cool part is that um, looking beyond just the unduplicated count of students, Tori went through and broke down the enrollment with every single ethnic group plus an unduplicated count to really get a, a look, a snapshot of what is the percentage of our student, of our Hispanic population as it relates to total students. Then looking at your enrollment in AP and honors classes, began breaking it down with our um, ethnic groups as well as our unduplicated count, really taking a look at how many of these different student groups are enrolling in our honors and AP classes and what that percentage uh, is compared to the enrollment percentage. So as an example, it would be in 2018-2020, let's look at English Honors 1, there's 37 students enrolled, there's seven Hispanics in that class for a total 18.9% Hispanics, Hispanic representation in that class. That's how you read this. And then you can look at, okay, what is the Hispanic overall enrollment, 24%. So you can look at your data and have that story told to you in terms of our, our, our student groups, our all these student groups. The one missing is students with disabilities. Tori is already working on that. Um, are these kids having access to these AP courses? It is in our core policy. It is, um, you know, just in various different ed codes. So this is a way to be able to expand what, if you scroll down, we, the school is uh, focused on Hispanic and unduplicated. It's expanding its lens to be the other uh, ethnicities. Um, other other reports that I think is that are pretty good. If you look at the Rim High School DF rate, um, that is four years, and again, it's it has been in focusing on Hispanic and unduplicated, or it wants to take it to the next level and do all ethnicities. But you'll see the um, if you go to that slide DF, you see the total amount of DFs. That's how many that were given out to. Didn't matter if it was one kick out five Fs or not. The, the little graph below, the total number of students with at least one D or one F, so only counted once, basically. So it gives you a snapshot of where that is. Again, Tori wants to put it on steroids and include the other student groups, including um, students with disabilities, so that we have a clearer picture of where we're at. One thing that we, we don't really um, go a lot into, but this is on the California Department of Education. If you go into the data quest, you can pull it up. And that's the really world towards the bottom. It's ROWUSD college going rate. Um, it's 2017 and 2018 is the most current year, but it gives you a snapshot of how are we doing? 
how are we doing with our kids and where are they going? Are they going to college? Where are they going to college? And how does that tell the story of, of A through G with switching to the A through G completion rate on Glam High School? Because that is the only school that, that has the A through G classes. You can see that they have been actually looking at all student groups, including students with disabilities, low income, and they are looking at the amount of, of kids that are meeting those requirements in order to qualify to apply to a CSU or a UC school, which hopefully that is our goal. In doing this, um, you can see through the years that we're really basically 30, under 30%. Um, the good news is that in the California Budget Trailer Bill, in which there is now a G grants, there's three of them, not pot of money, one is an access grant, one is a grant, you may, over 67%. The asset access grant is under 67%, and then there's an a G learning loss mitigation grant. So when I uh, attended the budget workshop, I emailed Kevin Gordon, I'm like, okay, here's Graham's picture, here's a card. Our unduplicated count range. Here's our age completion rate under 30%. Are we going to get money or assisted concentration? His answer was that we will get the minimum $75,000 for the access grant and $75,000 for the learning loss mitigation. So that was pretty cool. So the really great part is that REM has been looking at this data. So when that conversation about using the, the money that the new money that's come in, they are been looking at this and they've been looking through these different um, segments through an equity lens um, and been doing the work to say how do we make the adjustments and Rambo World at itself has been doing that through whether it's the LCAP, the um, reports that Heather has given to us about the different student populations that they're about how are our student populations are really doing and what can we do better? What can we do differently? What is happening next year that didn't happen this year? And so those conversations are in the right direction. They are. We, it's not like we haven't been doing equity work, we've been doing it, but not saying, okay, we're doing equity now, bring, bring, bring the thing. let's come to the table. We've been doing it for, for a very long time. So now we're just going to put the spotlight on it, on our work that we've been doing for so long. And as we go through with meeting with stakeholders, we're, we're going to use the code and the data. Tori's working on high school data. We have the SIPSAS as the roadmap for all the schools and the stakeholders can see this information and understand, oh, okay, your respondents are enrolling in AP courses. Okay, great. So if the data is there to, to help guide the conversations. Done? Yeah, I went fast. You did two minutes. Huh? She promised that. You did two minutes, Cindy. I told you I did that. Congratulations. Impressive. <laughs> so as I mentioned, we had several of these cap moments in which, uh, again, they're meant to cause you to think of this specific, particular video is uh, people versus the school system. And, and it's a great um, video for um, is this is the school system performing like it should? And if it's not, I think you should be suing the like, school system. And so it's a it's a provocative drama on well, a suit against the school system. The next one is a video that um, is the unequal opportunity race, and we're actually gonna try to play this one for because so it's in the other file. Uh, the, as I said, these videos are in there. There are four different folders there in the, uh, in the 
Equity and Social Justice Committee folder under board documents. Marking the presentation folder it looks like it'll play. We have a separate out from California. Thanks, Mike. So as you were watching that video, we were going to take the time right now. What, what things in that video were confirmed for you? What questions do you have that you would ask? Have you seen that? And what provoked you? And there may be different things from that as well. But I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to leave that in your thoughts right now. As we went through, we tried to understand what it means to redefine student success with an equity lens. It means we need to look at things from a cultural identity, relevance, and relationships, and what kind of rigor is expected of the various students. Um, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to go through every detail here. I'm just trying to show you some of the things 
We're looking at unpacking cultural differences in race, ethnicity, and cultural identity. We need to follow the slides. I'm flipping along lines. Thank you, Cindy. So, and we did that. Yeah, it's full screen there, right, Mark? Okay. Uh, so, there's one I'm catching up to. Unpacking cultural differences, and, and we all know that there's differences in race, there's differences in ethnicity. We see that in language barriers right here in, in our district. We want to, I gave to you uh, the homework assignment that we had, and so now we'll be looking at tallying up where is the board in its own evaluation of our equity. Uh, and so we did an equity assessment, and I'll be compiling that for us. And we'll see where we're at today and then see where we're at in a few, few years from now. There are stereotypes that, um, uh, that we're dealing with all the, all the time, exaggerations that and stereotypes that we make of people of uh, different nationalities and all. For example, um, if, if I asked you, how well do Asians do with math, what would you say? There's a variety of different stereotypes that we might have. Uh, and right there, uh, which one would you want to um, to take care of your home? You're just the very image because it's a stereotype. Uh, by how they're how a person address. We have the implicit biases that, that all of us have, and we talked about those. And, and let's face it, we all have bias, we all have stereotypes, we all have some prejudice. It's, what do we do with those things and how do we adjust them so that we don't hinder or hold back people, particularly in education? There's implicit biases. Everyone, for example, and then statements right up there, everyone has them, including those who are committed to being impartial in decision making. Even judges have to work to keep themselves to be impartial, even though, and, and, and but yet we still have them. We still have certain biases that go with us throughout life. We looked at how do we increase our community's capacity to empower and support our youth. And this is one of the things where we're really seeing how, how are we involving our youth in learning about where they're at? So anything, any discussions we have about equity, we've got to talk to youth that are going through our school system. We've got to talk to youth that are in our school system and in our community that might not even be in our system, but they're in our community under our responsibility. We have to have an effective leveraging of an equity task force. And I'm gonna start probably politicking here, but this is something that we need to look at is, Said this, we formed a committee. The committee needs, needs to be so much broader, so far expanded, so that it truly becomes a task force. A task force that looks at collaboration, like we talked about, there it is, we talked all this morning about collaboration, that looks at research, both hard data as well as soft data, that looks at recommendations. Uh, and, and, and the task force then would come up with these steps to give us recommendations to the board. We need to build a safe environment. We need to build a capacity for content and knowledge. Um, and so we need to maybe have a much broader committee than what we already have. Um, and then you can see some of the outcomes that we would hope for. Equity would impact an action plan of development with a systems lens. How is everything we're doing helping every student to succeed? And then some of the break, uh, we were put into breakout sessions and we got to interact with other board members from other districts. And it was interesting. Um, one district that was very far ahead in their equity work, um, they said that having those listening sessions um, where, and, and Bill, I'm going to expand upon. Having listening sessions where they're conducted all in Spanish with only that um, Hispanic population so that they feel safe to be able to express everything that they wish to express. So listening sessions become very important for you to be able to really have a clear idea of what um, students are experiencing, what parents and community members, and what our former students experienced during their time frame. You have to listen. So then um, there was a list that they put up, and there were steps. Districts are at all different places in this process. 
Some districts have statements and policies and, and classes and training like that. What do you have? Changing their grading policy at this point. I mean, they're so far ahead. Yeah, yeah. So there's all kinds of things. So here is actually a, a good list of self-assessment to say where are you in the process. And, and and there's several, you know, really valuable items on here. Obviously, we haven't even done our own statement yet. We're in that process. So we're working on an equity policy. Um, we have a committee, we may want to turn that into a task force. Uh, and then we can go on through the rest of that list. Moving on. So here's some recommended steps that uh, this came in our final session that they have for the governance team. That's us kids. Um, to share new concepts with fellow board members. That's what we're somewhat doing here today, sharing with you some of the things that we got. And we have a lot more in the folder there for you to look at. But we're going to give you an assignment. You see that in there. We should have study sessions focused on each of the different priorities. Uh, we may we should evolve an equity statement. It's really important that an equity statement not be our statement, but something that would be formed by, I'm going to say, the community. When I say the community, that's all of the stakeholders. So we're talking about educators, we're talking about administration, we're talking about staff, we're talking about students in the community, students in our schools, we're talking about parents, we're talking about business and professional people. We need to have something that is drawing focus and insight from a variety of people that we work a statement, we develop a statement, and together, they have to present that for approval. Cindy, you were going to say something? No, uh, and I was going to say that sometimes in those conversations, you may hear things that, that are, are in our practices or in our the way that we do things that are a little bit tough to take, especially from our former students. Um, it, it can be a little just heartbreaking to hear their experiences and you have to to honor those experiences michelle i was just going to add when we look at this the next steps and recommended steps that are here i have like to go back to natalie's words earlier about trust um, equity is not a check off the box we've done a statement we've done a policy um, trust is something that evolves and changes just like equity so as we begin this work and we have our training and we talk about next steps, we have to think of that as um, something that will just become part of our being versus um, something that we've done. We will always want every student to excel. Always. And if that ever stops, then we probably should get out of education. No offense, man. So they, they would say, suggesting then that after evolving an equity statement, you identify key priorities support things that you need to be addressing first in order to help meet the needs of every student. Involving the, the equity policy and leveraging the equity task force to inform strategic planning. You want to continue to have people giving you input so you can plan better for the future. Yes. Okay. Five minutes. I know, and we're good. Okay. <laughs> in developing an equity statement, here's some of their suggestions. You need to communicate, communicate clear and common language about equity as a lens for all district policy. It needs to be a component of the equity policy. It needs to be student centered. Explicitly call us out in equity. Thank you. Thank you. It explicitly calls out inequities in the data. It's measurable and associated with data. It can't be just about feelings. It, it, the language aligns with our vision and our mission of our district and includes stakeholder voices in the process. That's at the bottom of the page, but that's got to be significant to the process. Here are some of the components of an equity policy. And um, things that we've kind of already been touching on from the background, vision, goals, equity statement, that those items right there, the practical applications, guys, all government governance practices. There's an evaluation of progress. There's more questions to the superintendent and staff. Uh, there's agenda building, decision making, prioritizing of work. 
referencing as the recentering of governance work. Why, what? And we could ask you then, okay, tell us how you're going to do it. And this is a cartoon. I'm sorry for if you're looking at long distance, you're not seeing it very well, but um, it it does have <laughs> the same thing. Who wants to change? Would anybody not say, oh yeah? <laughs> no, we want everything never to change, right? No. Who wants to change? Everybody wants to change. Okay, who wants to change? Uh, all of a sudden there's no hands up. And then the third one, who's willing to lead the change and everyone disappears? <laughs> Which takes us to our final slide. And I this. I'm yet fine. here's your homework. You have to find in the folder this article. Restarting school with equity at the center. I think I actually taught that style of energy school. I'd like you to read that before we have our next group. Cindy or Michelle, anything to add, Michelle? Great job, Bill. <laughs> we made 60 minutes less. I will say that, you know, the it was really interesting to um, follow those norms that the day you saw on one of the slides. And when we did our breakouts, I always ended up in a group that did not have Bill and Cindy. So, and there were less superintendents in the room than there were board members. So I got to know other other board members. And it was, it was very uh, um, respectful and safe conversations. And some of those board members have reached out to me since then and just thanked me for the frank conversations and wanted to say that, you know, we have an ally or someone to talk to as we go, all of our districts and bet on this work together. And the other thing is, is in terms of making connections, um, spiritual connections, um, Riverside County has, at the start of the pandemic, started holding conversations and coffee, coffee and conversations. And um, Robert Garcia is on the board he um, was reached out and, and invited people from Sandaps, and then I, I think I sent you all um, that was an equity conversation. Dr. Judy White, who was a former superintendent of Riverside County, who does a lot of equity training, University of Redlands, that kind of stuff. And um, so it's interesting how the ripple effect, like your connections and your conversations, then somebody says, hey, why don't you? This is happening. Why don't you come and, and have this? Join us with this, and then you learn more because you're you're especially like with this coffee and conversations, listening to a Dr. Judy White or a Dr. Trevina Betters, who's with the county who does equity work with districts, and and it, that's that's how you learn. And for me, learning is one of my strengths, and so this is really going to be one of my big strengths. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Cindy, especially for helping us to make sure. Oh, I have to hold it down. It might help you to, yeah, we, your microphone's not set up, but. No, it's not. So, so I just have to read the word. Okay. Mark, you can't switch it real quick again. No. no. <laughs> it's a big <laughs> microphone change, I think. Okay, so just keep reminding me if I go off track here. Um, Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Cindy, especially because you helped us stay on time when um, the data could have really driven us off, off time. Ten minutes. I did ten minutes. I'm, I'm totally, totally impressed. So that, that ends the, uh, the CSPA Equity Committee report. Unless anyone from the board has questions. Okay, then we'll move on to seven, seven direction 4.2 structure of the committee. And um, with this, I'd like to share just a few. A few, a few comments. First, um, I appreciate the fact that every member of this board believes that equity is an issue that we need to work on. That um, everyone is concerned about that's different passions, different interests, and a, and a commitment to this. And I think because of that, we try to form a committee of the whole. Um, I need to say that I think that hinders us some. That in spite of how committed we are to it, it hinders us from open discussion that we need to be able to have. Um, it, 
We, we, we all have passionate thoughts about this, and everyone wants to be a part of that discussion, but, but being a committee of a whole actually limits our conversation rather than opening up our conversation. Plus the fact that we need to include stakeholders in the conversation. And I, as I looked at this and walked through this process during these first few weeks, and, and since we went to our training on I'm saying, stakeholders need to be involved now, not later. Not something that we do down the road and then kind of like now share with them. They need to be a part of the whole learning development process. We need to have a process of developing and promoting critical thinking. Um, that has to happen and continue. And it's going to have to continue. I mean, we're in, a, in, in the time, for, time that we're in, we've got to be doing critical thinking. We want to have a conversation about equity that doesn't stop. Michelle said it, and Cindy touched on it as well. If equity is not going away, we need to be respectful and collaborative and data driven in our conversation. So I'd like to recommend that we seriously look at forming a subcommittee. Is it appropriate for me to say here? <laughs> For us to form a subcommittee with two people from the board, so we're not dealing with any kind of Brown Act issues that hinder discussion. And that committee obviously reports back to the board. And that we select two members from the board that, that form, start formation of that subcommittee. And that subcommittee then gets immediately, as soon as possible, brought in to other stakeholders. Um, Cindy or Michelle want to say anything to that? I just want to say that um, we had a lengthy discussion about this, and, and part of our training led us to back to those original discussions we had when we started this committee. Should it be a committee of a whole? Um, everyone wants to be a part of this, and, and then realizing that the structure that we have in place doesn't allow us to obtain the goals that we want to obtain. Because we have to be very strict in following Brown Act and, and public comments, we can't have courageous conversations and critical thinking conversations that are data driven. And I think that our training, the three of us have had, um, will help lead um, that subcommittee. Um, I, I do think that you know there were all good intentions in place, and and still getting back to the board as a report much like we did with um, the media committee, but having um, this one have stakeholders in it, I just think that those recommendations, you know, we, we didn't know, they weren't educated enough to think about the, the how. How do you, uh, or how many stakeholders do you envision? How do you envision including that? There are, there are recommendations we've received from our training. You know, I think that there could be different list, listening sessions with different stakeholder groups, but a formal like committee, um, you know, they work well with like seven or nine. Um, that kind of thing has been recommended, but the listening um, sessions that they're talking about or recommending, that those can be with numerous folks in, in different settings, like one in Spanish and those several in Spanish or whatever we need to gather feedback enough to look at policy, make yeah. statements, have conversations about how our kids feel in school. And, and when you have those listening sessions where you are creating a safe space where people can be honest and courageous about our conversation, you have it like-minded. So you have, if you want to have, you really talk to your alumni and you, you know that what their experience is K-12, I mean, you have an experience with K-12 being a graduate from this. What are their experiences? What did they face? And you create, a, and they're a distant from the experience in their adults, so they don't fear retaliation. They don't feel, feel intimidated. Whereas students, if you have a student group, having teachers with the students, does, it doesn't create that safe space. So you want to make sure your listening sessions are safe spaces for your individual groups. And, and Michelle's right, the listening sessions can be whatever. How many, there's no limitation on listening sessions. And then and that that is collated together to bring back to the committee 
and the committee members are listening are in on these listening sessions, and board members can be in on listening yeah. sessions. And I think they can relate it to the work of like a bunch of two board members on the budget committee. They've had a lot of training this last year from Jenny. Um, Jordan being my ABC team member, he knows the progression where we went from monthly meetings and schedules and calendars to what we are right now and how we progress. So there's that history and that, that teaching that's taken that's taking place. So um, you know, looking at that structure in that that way to move it forward and report back to the board. But frankly, Natalie, to ask you your question, we have not tried to determine an international number. What Michelle's pointing out is seven nine maybe number, but we haven't actually tried to identify that. We're kind of looking at this first step of what if we move from a committee of whole to a subcommittee? And remember, I just want to remind us our, we got counsel that said it would be this is somewhat unusual and extraordinary. And, and even as I've been working on you know, some of these things, like, okay, how do I make a proposal? Because this is not the board, but it's the board. So go ahead. Well, I can hear what you're saying. I think any of those of us who would not be on that subcommittee would be disappointed to not be on that subcommittee, yet respectful of the fact that effective work is more important than us being involved in every aspect of it. Well, and one of the slides recommended that Bill showed recommended three subcommittees. Now I'm just three tests. Three right, I'm just giving ideas. So if if the subcommittee was the two board members, for example, that attended the training, there could be board members that also help with the listening session, the listening sessions, and those kind of things, so that that you are a part of. Yes, we may actually need to then create other subcommittees that are related. To this one too. So, so but I, I appreciate that. You to appreciate this direction. Right. Our first elections would say yes on this subcommittee, and then as you guys spend the next period of time uh, determining what you would need from us, I think just knowing that we would all love to be at least five, but everyone would love to be involved in the process of where I why we're all sitting here right now. Um, and want to learn and want to grow to contribute. Uh, but again, if, if it's not effective, then why not? And we can also do that as, as a part of reporting back the subcommittee's reports and conversations back to a regular board meeting. It could be an agenda item. Jordan and Jordan, I really want to hear your thoughts. Well, actually, I have a question to begin with, just so you can understand. So if we have a, a subcommittee that has uh, two board members on it, would that in essence then negate the need for uh, all five of us to be meeting as a social justice committee. So that while the standing committee would still be there, it would actually be no longer helpful. I'd be recommending that when we take action to finish the whole committee and the subcommittee only. So to so avoid we that board meeting to spend the committee. committee. Yes. Okay. So, the next and board meeting is after. And then we would end up having um, the subcommittee with two board members, and who we determine, or who they determine, who comprise the rest of the structure of the committee. Okay. And I, I should say, Dan, we're suggesting that it probably be the two of us, but it doesn't have to be. And the only reason why we're suggesting that we get those through training, so we've got we've got some hours put into this. But but I understand every single one of you have a stake in this. Well, very much. What Natalie said, I'd say we say most. I, I, I do, I am interested, and I want to be able to make sure, like it's been repeated many times today, is that all of our students are receiving an optimum experience for them. And I trust that everybody in this room has that same passion. And I would trust you, Cindy, and actually any of the four of you to be representing the board in, in, in the committee. So, I also do understand and appreciate the complexities of having more than two of us and how that really ends up becoming crippling. So um, it, it almost like it creates an unsafe uh, um, environment to be able to do the work that you need to do because you are, are bound by Brian. So, yeah, so those are my thoughts. Jordan? Uh, I appreciate the time and hope that everyone, you, Michelle, and uh, Cindy, invested into, into this uh, so far. 
looking at uh, this structure and transitioning it to something like a subcommittee, I'm open to that idea. What I would really like, and I think would be ideal, and maybe provide some assurances, following Michelle's suggestion, if we have these subcommittees already in line, so that we know that every board member can still participate in some way, then I think that might be the best route forward as opposed to starting one, then potentially inviting other committees for some or board members at a later date. I think that that what we want to do is is make sure if you transition, if, if that's the direction we're going to a subcommittee, we don't have to have three subcommittees or four subcommittees. I mean, if we end up with only two subcommittees, say like the subcommittee and then the, the sub subcommittee that holds the lesson, the listening session, say the listening subcommittee, whatever. I mean, and, and during the course of the work, you may need to create another subcommittee, but you don't know that until you do the work. There are districts that had only one committee, that's it. They, and there's others that had multiple committees that looked at different pieces of the puzzle. And Joanna, I don't want to, I'm just going to put it out there. And I'm, for the no one who's listening, um, there was a, a, a component that looked at grading policies and practices. That was part, was like a subcommittee of for lack of a better word, the task force this is the overall subcommittee. So there were pieces that as they got further down the road, that they realized, okay, this is part of the work. And let's delegate, ooh, look at my, my weakness. Let's delegate to, to those that have the passion and the strength and the knowledge to go in, into complaining at the Jordan to something like grading policy and practices. So those are so we're not going to be able to set up every single one because we're not going to know until we're further down. I mean we do know that we want to conduct listening sessions because that was something that was um, very powerful in um the work of the of the overall subcommittee this one district and I think that that's something that we need because we shouldn't be assuming you know what our Hispanic students are going to say, and what they need, and what the parents need. Um, it's you know what I'm saying. Thank you, Jordan. Frankly, we haven't tried to think into those divisions of what those other subcommittees would be. We've obviously thought about some of the process, but um, I don't have a. We don't have that spelled out right now, but that's a, something that we could definitely try to work on. I don't think it'd be there before. The next I think my proposition, let's see if, uh, if anyone's amenable to this. I guess what it comes down to is I don't I don't think that I would be in favor of dissolving this committee until we know what those committee, those subcommittees will look like. Now, my proposition would be that we create go ahead and create a sub a single subcommittee, have two board members on it, and let them start that work, let them do that work. And once we know how that's going, what needs to be done, what needs to be created, uh, I think I feel like this committee should still stand, just because it, even in our quarter, we found out that we put a couple of committees on while I was after one year. So I would want equity to fall by the wayside in any way. So I, I, that would be my proposition. Why don't we go ahead and kind of start going down that right route until we get everything established and moving? Then we would vote this one. I think that's like too much governance because then the subcommittee reports to the state committee that reports to the board. I think it's it's just a temporary measure until we can, uh, you know, formalize things. Because, like I said, we look for the committees on the committee on pause, the time the committees on pause. What's to say that we're not, you know, what if we put this new subcommittee on pause and oh no, we don't have a standing committee anymore? There's nothing to pull up from. I have, I'm curious. I, We are talking about only a listening session and we can come up one as an outreach 
thing and that kind of thing, how that evolves. I mean, to sit there and say, we're now going to have a commit a subcommittee that looks at the new policies and practices. It, right, establishing that right now may not be conducive to making sure that the work is done first so that the that other committees have direction. So what we what I was recommending was that not that we form a subcommittee of the committee, but be a subcommittee of the board. Um, do I have consensus that we could at least put this on the agenda? And I think Jordan, because the subcommittee reports to the board, why would you let that drop then as a board member? You got we would still have control over how often that committee meets the reports back to the board, especially on, on the front of the governance. So then it becomes the, the onus of responsibility to make sure that it does what you want, the board wants it to do, is still on the board, the five members of the board. If that subcommittee is made at the August board meeting, then that subcommittee could then have been tasked with bringing back to the next project, the next board meeting calendar, the subcommittees that they they task. I think that we can all trust each other to do that for the subcommittee, and so that we know that the first the first two steps are defined by board meeting dates and what they will be, and that would uh, ensure the committee is moving forward in a successful time and manner. And frankly, I see the subcommittee meeting more than once a quarter. Yeah, yeah, agree, agree. So what I'm looking for is consensus to be able to present this as an action item on the next board meeting. That we at least discuss. That's what I'm just looking for. Thumbs up or down? Can we present this as an action item? Yes. Uh, my only my only suggestion was a not come coupled with a action item to dissolve this committee. Yeah. That's what it is. That's how it is. I would be interested in a, in an action item to create a new subcommittee. I think Natalie's right that we're not going to be holding on to this committee for a long time. I just want to have it sort of as a wedge to ensure that progress doesn't slip in any way. And then I don't see an issue of creating something in the August board meeting, you know, creating a new subcommittee, having them start up, having them meet, and then by October, our next board meeting, maybe we can easily see, okay, let's go ahead and dissolve this one now. Uh, it's not a long time frame on so you guys think that I'm, I'm just going to suggest that the whole point is of doing this is because we are the board. And so when you create a subcommittee that is responsible to the board, it answers back to the board, does everything through the board. But the decision making is by the board. So we still remain the board. <laughs> so that's why this is this is redundant. But, yeah. but I appreciate it. Well, that. and that can be a reflection of a vote from August 19th. You can't yeah. vote today. And you get yeah. right yeah. now. No, and the one thing I would ask is actually give us some homework. Mm -hmm. Ask for some homework on um, the people who the training. I think it's on slide 23 where it's effectively leveraging the equity task force. I'm going to process some timelines. There is a bullet point that says three subcommittees. Mm -hmm. But where I was telling Jordana, this is all recommendation. This is giving tools if you wish. But when we listen to the other districts on how they work, it's these are suggestions of helping you get started. But there's there wasn't not at every district had three subcommittees doing this work. But what I was going to ask is for the folks who the from Nicole Anderson and Associates Consulting possibly ask them if they had what they had in mind when they just put down those three subcommittees. So when we discuss in August, that might help us be able to possibly have that structure to help us feel more comfortable about dissolving this name. So I so I may include it in the action item, but we can vote it down or up. Okay. So that way the action item is there for us. But obviously you can break it in parts, you can you can uh, vote it down, or we can table something. So all those things, there's all kinds of steps we can take at, at the board meeting. The main thing is I want to get this back to us as the board so that we can take some action. There's also like there's some, some like this is this cool one from and Robert Garcia, those that have been doing work, there's also Glenn Rogers and Dr. Margaret Hill from San Bernardino City Unified that work with Dr. Trina Beggars on their 
on their equity work, I can reach out to them with emails and ask them, how did you set this up? What was your story on how it set up? Because I, the, then giving you real world examples of, I, I know for a fact that, that one school district when they went further down the road did do a grading and policy uh, subcommittee that, and it worked for years. That didn't, ha that didn't happen in one year. That committee worked on that in collaboration with teachers and administrators and experts and blah, 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 for years on that issue alone. So, so some of these subcommittees are not one and done, and, so, and some didn't have sub subcommittees whatsoever because the subcommittee itself did all the work. We have we need to move on to finish our agenda. So, so I'm hearing consensus at least to be able to put this on the agenda for, for board action. And, and we can uh, work on that at that time. So thank you. If you have your presentation, I, I would have you look at slide 26. Uh, I don't know if you did a backup mark or not, but um, slide 26 discusses how to develop an equity statement, and we have now 35 minutes, but less than that. I have a question. Yep. Is this, if our intention is to have this work be done by a subcommittee, because that's where honest conversations can occur, um, it is setting the groundwork for an equity statement by all of the board at this moment what we are supposed to do. We, we discussed that in the work that you're going to see Dylan and us discuss right now is the groundwork that you would need to know what the subcommittee is going to do with the statement by, by focusing on board policy, which is within your, your scope of work. Okay. How, how different point of order in terms of structure of the committee? Um, we could talk about having two board members but in terms of possibility additional committee members, was that going to be part of our discussion as well? No, committee members are part of the subcommittee's job to see who they want to be involved in that process. So if we're still on structure of the committee, then I'm going to go ahead and say, do you have some input on whether you would allow the two of us to be the representatives? Well, I think that's. You just want me to put that in the proposal? My input is I would be absolutely fine with you and some of the people who've gone through the training already to be the two board members, but I also think that that would be something that could be part of our discussion among us. But it helps to have it in the proposal ahead of time, I think, so that we can take action on the actual proposal. Thoughts on that, Jordan? Yeah, I don't, I don't have an issue with how it's structured because you know, if it was the creation of the subcommittee, and we can talk about who's going to be on it, it would just be a simple amendment. If for some reason you were Cindy didn't want to be on it, then that would be another simple amendment in, in that time. So I'm going to it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, now 4.3. Ready? Ground, groundwork for the equity statement. And I asked uh, Mark, I asked Mark to put the slide back up here, which shows. Uh, how you develop an equity statement. And first line here is communicates clear and common language about equity as it lends for all district policy work. So do you want me to ask them to put up in your folder? Let me finish this and then I was going to turn to you. Um, that it's going to be a component of the whole equity policy, which we have us have one to share, that, that it's got to be student-centered that explicitly calls out any inequities that we see in the data. Mind you, this is data driven, that it's measurable and associated with data. If the language aligns with our vision and mission of the district, and even our definition of equity is at the top of this too, that includes stakeholder voices in the process. And now Cindy has a presentation. Okay, so um, I'm gonna 
Uh, we were given samples of some other districts and organizations' equity policies. Um, we were also given the CSBA sample policy that has been worked on extensively at the state level with attorneys. Um, there are many districts that have adopted the CSBA sample work policy in, in its without any changes which, whatsoever. If you pull up you could follow Mesa, they are the exact same CSBA sample policy. So one thing that in talking about the CSBA policy, Paul Anderson, our lead trainer, talked about was that there was a specific um, paragraph in the CSBA the CSBA sample that districts may want to look at to, to modify to their district and maybe not include because it was as one concern citizens that it was a little, it's a, it can be constituted as a little divisive in its language. Is that a good way to put it? Okay, so yes. in, com in coming up with that, um, I highlighted in the box um, the information that attaches itself to all of the CSBA policies that we get that kind of gives you background and pursuit. Do you see it? It's in the. It's in the very first folder, right? The, and it says the second so it CSBA sample board policy. So it outlines all of the, the language in Ed Code, in um, uh, most of it's in Ed Code. So the um, what I did is is I did take out the, the paragraph that was a little bit controversial, which was in order. So in the CSB, let me back up. So in the CSB sample policy, the first paragraph, the governing board believes that is CSBA. The second paragraph is on the CSBA line was in order to eradicate institutional bias of any kind, including implicit or unintentional biases and prejudice that affect student achievement, and to eliminate disparities in educational outcomes for students from historically underserved and underrepresented populations, the district shall proactively identify class and cultural biases as well as practices, policies, and institutional barriers that negatively influence student learning, perpetuate achievement gaps, and impede equal access to, to opportunities for all students. That really doesn't get us to where we want to be, nor our overriding philosophy of, of providing students what they need when they need it. So instead of taking a, a, a paragraph from a, another um, board, pop, uh, board um, that's where the second paragraph came into, recognizing that we need to be explicitly Calling out that there are achievement gaps and being explicit of what that means, and that um, that we're, it's all based in data. Then um, I did put in our wonderful definition of equity. So if you scroll down, I inserted equity. The our definition that we already approved. I was like, yes, we're going to put that in our policy. And that was actually a recommendation by CS. The final goal is to, to look at your policy and make it your own and maybe include things like your equity statement and, defi and your definition of equity as per what you decided as a board. Scrolling down, I did highlight one thing in yellow <laughs> because this was troubling to me and I talked to Michelle about it. And that's promoting the employment and retention of a diverse staff that reflects the student dem demographics. The issue is that for us in our candidate pool, we have challenges in our rural lo location, our geography, and our weather that preclude some people from wanting to come up the hill. And, and so when we have a candidate pool of 10 biology teachers and we need a biology, a biology teacher in four weeks, and we have we come up, there is one that is in consensus that's being highly qualified and meets the standards, that's what we have. That's what we have and to contend with. So I wanted us to be able to at least have that ability to recognize that we do have challenges sometimes in our candidate pool that are, are due to our location, our weather, our, our um, geography. Michelle thought that was really good. I think they had that challenge. 
pretty much every single time a position is flown. But everything else is exactly CSBA. This is exactly CSBA. Yeah, we just been through a big course on policy making. It was really helpful to see how the CSB has laid this out with the various different numbers. Um, it lines up with the code, which is which is very helpful. But this is what they recommended with our with our adjustments to personalize it for us. And so we're presenting it to you to now look at and kind of examine. Um, work through. Uh, this is time for you to look at points, but but work on it after today. And and I did leave the box in and I highlighted in yellow so that you guys could see that in that second paragraph of the policy, the language we just are reiterating what's in that code. It it helps and then that way the box goes away, but the language remains. When it's if this if in any direction we go, then the information box is just taken out. Michelle, do you have anything else to say about this uh, CSBA draft policy? No, but the next the next steps, unless there are any recommendations for changes, would be to bring the board regular board meetings to be adopted. But, but the committee. The committee needs time to yes, uh, yes. review it. And this is the first time yes. you're seeing it. So I would be really uncomfortable with saying, okay, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down right now on this. You could also do a first read and a second read. Being that it was introduced today, we can bring it as an agenda for our first read, I believe, if I'm speaking correctly. And then the second read would be the final adoption if there were any amendments. I've seen it done like that in other districts. We do first so we, read and second read, so it takes an, an additional two board meetings after this one. Would that include opportunity for public comments in the jail? Yes. Yes. So Which is the point yes, both times. So the, the one thing that I want to ask you yet a little bit consensus would be testing of of putting that little caveat about the candidate pool. Are you guys cool with that little bit of recognition so that? We're not being hammered that we're not doing enough. We'll try really hard just to even try to get candidates sometimes. I think it's fantastic to mention that because it could be it could be really rotating between we're trying to can we slack? Yeah. That's what I was going to change. That's my thought. I appreciate it, Cindy. Um, but I'd like to have that in this block when we get every Every item that's on. No, I know. If, if no one liked it, I would just put it back to the exact CSBA language, and then you guys can digest the rest of it. Because if I was way out of base in my thought process, I wanted to get some feedback. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, presenting this as a first read because. Not we haven't normally done that as a board. Because I'm not going to just do the first read, but to do that process, we haven't normally done that. No, 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 this is, yeah. We have done it on some things in the past. Kirk, when you, the last year and a half, we have been catching up on making board policy current. So staff has been doing that. So each of the cabinet members have taken their the board policies that pertain to them. And so when they come to you at a board meeting, um, we have them doing that because they've been doing the reading to make sure that it fits them. So as the committee chair, how can I be assured that we do a to read on this? Just direct the superintendent and put it on the um the next two agendas and kind of make sure that happens. Or if you have the the committee agenda. Yeah. Correct. And you just told me yes, yes so I'll do it. <laughs> just just want to make sure. Okay, so, so um, but in between now and then, please, board, be looking at it, um, put marks on it, and give us give us thoughts to it. Just keeping in mind that 
when we see when board policy, the board equity policy and the equity statement, the students that the students need to see themselves in it. it so we want to be explicit um, in language at times because we do want our students to make sure that they see themselves in the policy, in the statement, or in and further in the actions we take. So hopefully you can see between the board making an equity definition, looking at the board policy, this is the groundwork for a statement that will be worked on with stakeholders through, through hopefully or through committee or subcommittee of the board. And the funny part is that in our breakout sessions, we were told, okay, we're going to have a statement, or if you have an equity statement, bring it in and but and have you guys look at it and see if it needs to be refined. And when we went into our breakout room, Michelle, Bill, and I were like adamant we opposed to doing it at Ren district equity statement. We for the very first meeting, we said this work needs to go to the stakeholders because the statement is the statement, it's not the report. Policy. This should not be three people doing it. And so we still in our breakout sessions, we had cool discussion, but we didn't work on it. And it would be statement. Yeah, because it was all good work at the last two meetings, especially they wanted us to do. And we just felt that, that was not so inappropriate. Not well, the steps we wanted to take to make to write an equity statement. But board policy, because it's written for us for the most part and and we already have a definition of great steps towards making that happen. All right. Anything else on groundwork for the equity statement? One thing, you know, as far as groundwork, I, I like it. And one thing that I'm noticing is um, the, the, the achievement gaps between, or, or so I'm looking at, um, I don't mean the paragraph is right before the CS. The board recognizes that achievement and opportunity gaps, gaps and disparate disparate actions exist among student groups. That's always going to be the case. Right. right. But that's the whole point of yeah. making, like Bill said, making sure that we acknowledge that we're, we're working on behalf of all students. Exactly. And so that's why we felt. In our discussion, that one particular paragraph sort of needed about certain students, and this one expands it to all students. But go ahead, Jordan, finish what you're going to say. Well, I just think that this, the second sentence in Young is basically saying that all students are going to um, are going to have access regardless of all of those different components. I almost feel like that first sentence might be implying that we're going to eliminate gaps. Yeah. And that, say that, again. that we're gonna that somehow it's feasible to eliminate gaps, but really what we're trying to do is optimize opportunities for every single student, which means that there isn't going to be equality. But right, but that's that's more like an AR or or actions. This is more of of It's intentionality that we are recognizing that the gaps exist, and we always do. We, we talk about that all the time. And so it's not saying that we're going to, there's no goal in here that says we're going to close, you know, the LCAP actually says we're going to close the, we're supposed to close the achievement gaps. But this says we recognize that there are achievement gaps. It doesn't say that we're going to close the achievement gaps because that is LCAP language. The word recognize this, Jordana, is that we recognize that there's gaps. It doesn't say we're doing anything at the board in board policy isn't going to do anything right then and there about the how, the outcome is then your how. And this is under the philosophy. Yeah, it's under philosophy and it's zero, 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 zero. So it's zero for one hour. I'm fine with it. My preference would be just to delete that first sentence. I'm not comfortable with that because the whole point is to recognize that there are issues and that and that this we recognize that there's issues. So it's ownership. Huh? It's ownership. It's ownership that we have that recognition. We're not stupid. We haven't overlooked it. And that we're that later in some other way we direct the superintendent to direct your staff on. Oh, towards housing, but the, the 
only that it exists. This is a necessary first step. Joanna, tell me about what it is that um, you are comfortable with here again. Um, Why you want to exclude it? Um, I think that the reason why I want to exclude it is that we will continue to strive to continue you know, to do better, and there will always be the, the gaps or disparate disciplinary action. The students who are choosing to take an action with one student and not another, you could put that student into any kind of a group. Um, so I think it I think it goes without saying that it sets up a negative connotation. And that negative connotation will always be there. There will always be um, there will always be variation in how students are going to be treated based on their actions. And those and that variation isn't necessarily linked to any of the demographics that we've listed. So I just I believe it puts our schools in a poor light when it actually is just kind of the nature of society is that we don't always have everybody being treated exactly the same that there is going to be those differences. I think that I, I think it's really crucial that we have a sentence like that in here because if we as a board adopt this policy, what it does is it one creates that ownership that this board recognizes that there are achieving an opportunity gaps and it prevents future board members or even current ones by all means that's the case but it will prevent future board members from saying that there are no equity gaps it prevents that type of irresponsibility uh, from future board members if we formalize this as a board policy yeah well second sorry <laughs> I said last time. All right, so we need to keep working through it, right? And so that hopefully we would have the same discussion at the board meeting when we go through it, but it also gives the community opportunity to go through this, which is, I think, really important also. Um, with that, I think we will move on to next steps which is 4.4. And you already have a couple of homework assignments. And so need to read the article that I put in there and I don't have it here in front of me, so I can't remind you of it. So someone help me. Restarting school with equity at the center. Thank you. <laughs> secondly, secondly, you need to review this policy statement and work through that. Thirdly, I would like you to answer the question, what is equity in your own mind? Um, in fact, you may want to come up with your own elevator speech of what, what is equity in an educational setting. We're not using our statement now, but just for you to be able to communicate, this is what equity means to us. And Michelle? Um, formally on next steps, we have will take those things to board. I heard that about first read, second read, the um, organization of the committee to a subcommittee. Um, I would like to make a recommendation that um, I would like to investigate talking to the person at the county level who does this work as um, the sub if the subcommittee were to move forward to look at none of us are experts. Yes, we had 12 hours of training. But um, it's a courageous and difficult, critical thinking conversations that we're about to embark upon. And I would like to um, at least explore the opportunities to have county facilitation and talk to is it Dr. Trina Betters. She'll be at C H R C H E R I N A Betters, B E T T E R S. Okay. So, I think there's a number of different people. So I think that's something that must come out of the committee. And, and as we look at multiple different people, she might be the right, the right person. I don't know. So I just think that's a place to start. And I'm not she, saying that's the be all and all. I just would like to reach out to her. And she has worked with um, the San Bernardino City Unified and several districts of the county. That's the county resource on their equity work. And, and uh, so that's what her, her job is. I also find that the county. Um, support is um, a lot more affordable than outside guests. Okay, I just don't know anything about her, so I don't know. Either, I don't either, and her name keeps coming up. 
I just want to meet her and talk to her about her work. All right, well, that's that's great. So is that okay? Can you give a thumbs up for Okay. Um, anything else that we need to do as far as um, next steps? I think that I mentioned that, uh, you know, she asked the uh, uh, Bill and Cindy and Michelle, but I think it might be good practice for all of us if we all look into, you know, what are I mean, this, these are all recommendations that you had saw for three subcommittees as an example. And you already know what up some other districts are doing. We should all probably look into that and see what other districts are doing anyway. So, why don't we, are we amenable to making that home design for all of them? Yeah. I already told Jordana that I would, re would reach out and send my notes to Jesus, Robert, Garcia, Glenn Rogers, Dr. Martin Hill, and a couple others that. Um, in regards to what they did. So Cindy's not really going to actually work for you. No, I don't know what I'm saying is that, is that, no, I'm saying is that if I, if I already said that I'm going to contact these people, I don't want you to go, oh, hey, Gwen. And right. then she has to repeat herself. So I'm, I'm t I think it's great that everybody does their homework. But since I already told Jordana to specifically contact these yeah. people, don't contact them because they're going to just think, I'm in an office. Or they're in the office. I'm 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 in the Second. And we move second, Cindy, to approve the minutes as presented. Is there any all those in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carry. Future agenda items planning. I have a lot of plain request agenda items for future meetings. Do you have anything I'm sorry, that's the same. Next steps. Sure. But in case somebody missed something. All right, then we'll move on. Future meeting dates uh, to be determined. And so at this point, uh, I don't think we're in calendar anything at this second. That's okay. And 7.0. 7 so 8.0, uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn early. So moved. I would adjourn at 3.50 p.m. Sorry. Moved by Cindy, second Natalie. I mean, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Meetings adjourned at 3 p.m. Thank you.